All right, welcome back. Apologia, third edition, week five, day five, textbook pages 104 to 108. All right. Now that you've had some experience using equation 3.1, which is our wavelength is the speed of light divided by the frequency, just take a peek at it for a quick moment. Notice how the equation shows that frequency and wavelength are related. As wavelengths get larger, equation 3.1 tells us that we will be dividing by a large number. So what does that tell you about frequency? It tells us that for large wavelengths, frequency is small. Conversely, if wavelength is small, frequency is large. When two quantities behave like this, we say that they are inversely related to one another. When studying light, this inverse relationship between frequency and wavelength is a very important one to remember. So when wavelength is large, frequency is small. When wavelength is small, frequency is large. This inverse relationship between frequency and wavelength should make sense if you think about it. Imagine yourself once again standing in the ocean. As you look at the waves coming toward you, if their crests are far apart, so if they have a large wavelength, they will not hit you very often. They will have a small frequency. However, if their wave crests are close together, so a small wavelength, they will hit you very often. They will have a large frequency. You may not realize that the light we see with our eyes, the visible spectrum, is only a small part of the light that comes to us from the sun. The sun bathes our planet with light of many, many different wavelengths and frequencies. Our eyes perceive only a small fraction of the total amount of this light. The figure here of the electromagnetic spectrum is more complete representation of all the light that comes from the sun. Again, we call that the electromagnetic spectrum. If you examine the spectrum, you will first realize just how small a part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we actually see with our eyes. The rainbow under the words visible spectrum represent that part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Everything else shown in the figure from wavelengths of 10 to the negative 14th meters all the way to wavelengths of 10 to the 4 meters is still light. Our eyes are sensitive only to the light contained in the visible spectrum, which means that is the only light that we can see. However, as you can tell by the figure, we find uses for much of the light that we cannot see. For example, the signals that are sent out from a radio station to our radio antenna are, in fact, waves of light. We cannot see these light waves, but they are there nevertheless. Since they are there, we can use them to carry radio signals, FM and AM radio signals, for example. The only difference between these light waves and the ones we see with our eyes is the wavelength. Wavelengths of light used to carry radio signals are longer than those of visible light. In addition, television antenna also use light with, lo with wavelengths longer than those of visible light. What, we, what may be even more surprising to you is that microwave ovens use light to cook food. Microwaves also have longer wavelengths than those of visible light. Notice that while we often use several of the light waves with wavelengths longer than visible light, we do not frequently use any of the light waves with wavelengths shorter than visible light. There's a very good reason for this. Light has energy. Its energy is kinetic since the light is moving. The energy of a light wave is directly proportional to its frequency. This is a very important fact that you really do need to memorize. As a light wave's frequency increases, its energy increases. As its frequency decreases, its energy decreases. 
Since frequency and wavelength are inversely related to each other, we could say this. As a light wave's wavelength increases, its energy decreases. So, as its wavelength decreases, its energy increases. And based on these two facts, light waves with wavelengths shorter than those of visible light have higher frequencies and therefore higher energy. This is very important consideration because when light strikes something, your eye, your skin, etc., it deposits its energy into what it strikes. When visible light strikes your eye, it deposits its energy there. As you'll see in the next experiment, your eye uses that energy to transmit signals to the brain, and that's what causes you to see. Light with wavelengths shorter than visible light has enough energy to kill living tissue. When ultraviolet light, the first thing in figure 3.11 with wavelengths shorter than those of visible light strikes your skin, it can kill some of your cells. If your skin is exposed to too much ultraviolet light, a large number of cells will die and you will get a burn on your skin, which we call a sunburn. You can avoid a sunburn by covering your skin with sunscreen, a lotion containing chemicals that have absorbed the ultraviolet light before it hits your skin. Because of the nature of ultraviolet light, God has built into this wonderful planet a very efficient system that filters out the majority of these rays. You may have heard some talk about the ozone layer. We will go into this in detail in the next module, but for now we'll say the ozone layer is part of a filtering system that God has designed to shield us from the destructive type of light. Although it is incredibly efficient, the ozone layer does allow some ultraviolet light through and that is why you can get sunburned if you stay out in the sun too long without protection. Gamma rays and x-rays are more energetic than ultraviolet light, so they are even more dangerous to living tissue. Nevertheless, we still use both of these forms of light occasionally in medical procedures. X-rays, of course, are used to examine bones and other aspects of our internal anatomy for diagnostic purposes. Although these x-rays will kill some living tissue, the risk is worth the benefit of being able to diagnose internal problems without surgery. Therefore, as long as you do not get x-rays frequently, your risk associated with the nature of the light is low and the benefit you get from the diagnosis of internal problems is high. Gamma rays are also used in some medical applications. For example, Certain types of cancer can be treated by exposing the cancerous site to gamma rays. Even though this leads to the death of healthy tissue, it can also lead to the death of cancerous tissue. So the risk of gamma ray exposure can be worth the medical benefit. Before we leave this section, let's talk about one point of terminology. Notice that this title, the electromagnetic spectrum, is titled the electromagnetic spectrum. That's because we know that light is an electromagnetic phenomenon. It is produced by the interaction of electrically charged particles. Light is often called electromagnetic radiation. Although that sounds like a scary term, it just means light. But it includes all wavelengths of light, not just the visible wavelengths. You need to know one more equation that deals with light. This equation relates the frequency of a light wave to its energy. As already mentioned, as a light wave's frequency increases, its energy does as well. The mathematical equation that governs this relationship is E equals H times F. In this equation, E is the energy of the light wave and F is the frequency. The symbol H refers to another physical constant called Planck's constant, named after its discoverer, German physicist Max Planck. This constant allows us to relate energy and frequency. Its value is 6.63 times 10 to the negative 31st, 34th joule per hertz. You don't need to memorize this number. It will be given to, in any problem for which it is needed. Instead of learning the value, look at the units. Notice that if we put those units into E equals H times F, we get the following. 
So if we use the units for Planck's constant of joules over hertz times the unit for frequency of hertz, we're left with energy equal to joules. So when this happens, the hertz units cancels, leaving joules as our energy unit. Remember, hertz means one per second. With that in mind, let's look at the unit for Planck's constant once again. So here's the unit for Planck's constant, joules per hertz. Hertz does mean one per second. So a joule divided by a hertz is actually a joule second. Because don't forget, when you're dividing by a fraction, you have to invert and multiply. So with that in mind, um, we get a joule second. And that's another way of expressing the unit for Planck's constant. All right, so in your notebook, make sure you do the on your own 3.6 and 3.7. The answers are in your book. Please also do practice problems number five and six and extra practice problems numbers five, six, and seven.